I'm Nima Rajan and this is Forum Daily Week in Review. The Trudeau government's second pandemic budget is on making life more affordable for Canadians. Finance Minister Christia Freeland's spending plan features multiple NDP priorities, such as dental care, building more homes, green jobs, and a tax on excess bank profits. That should help the Liberals easily pass this budget, even given their new deal with the New Democrats. Federal spending falls to $452 billion in the new fiscal year, with a deficit of $52 billion. Well, with us to discuss the budget is Elliot Hughes, Senior Advisor at Summa Strategies. Sir, welcome back to Forum Daily. Thanks for having me. So what would you say are the main points in today's budget announcement? Yeah, you touched on this. So housing is the is the big piece. This government wants to be seen as addressing the challenges associated with housing. So you've got tax relief, you've got money for municipalities to buy new housing, you've got money for affordable housing as well. The other big piece was to show and to demonstrate that they're a good partner to the NDP in this new agreement they have. They've invested a significant amount of money, five billion and change, into dental care. That's going to make the NDP very happy and make it very difficult for them to oppose this budget. And then the final piece that I was most particularly interested in, um, in light of the current events happening around the world and Ukraine and so on, is investment in the military. We see $8 billion pr primarily for NORAD modernization, so continental defense, but there's also money in there to get, the ar to get arms directly into the hands of Ukrainians, um, which is something that the, the minister and Anne, the defense minister have spoken about. All right, Mr. Hughes, let's uh, zoom in on the spending promises now. I want to start with housing affordability in particular. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the promises around housing affordability in Canada. Well, the, the government knows that this is an issue that is becoming much more prevalent uh, across the country and, and impacting a lot more people. And they knew that they had to do something about housing. Uh, they see themselves as being able to have affect and help on the supply side of this. Um, so they're going to provide municipalities with, I believe, up to $4 billion. Uh, the numbers are, are flying around right now, uh, just in the, uh, the minutes afterwards. But I believe $4 billion to municipalities, um, which will help um, you know, flow that money a lot quicker and to hopefully lead to, uh, to houses being built. We, we have a supply problem in this country when it comes to housing. So that's one area. The, the other piece is, is directly going into you know, pe helping people's pockets when it comes to housing. So they're going to increase the home buyers tax credit, and they're going to give some money specifically for renovations to you know, your house. Those things are going to be able to be felt at the ground level on the individuals themselves. And that's something that I think this government wants to be shown. They, they understand this is a problem and they want to be seen as, seen as doing something about it and helping people directly. All right, sir. And what about military expenditure? That's been a major topic with the invasion of Ukraine. We're also seeing NATO pressure on Canada for that. So what changes to the defense budget are we seeing? The government has said they're going to set aside or add $8 billion to the current defense plans, which is called Strong, Secure, Engage, which might sound like a lot of money. But when you think that Germany invested 100 billion euros over a couple of years, $8 billion doesn't seem like all that much. I wonder how our allies are going to, frankly, how are, going to, how are they going to see that? Um, you know, we want to be seen as a, as a key member of NATO uh, and a key member of NORAD, obviously, with the United States. But if that's the case, we're probably going to have to make some more significant investments. Now, uh, the other piece uh, that, that they announced today in the budget was a review of the defense po default policy, which I just mentioned. Now, that's interesting because that potentially opens up in areas for using some money on projects that perhaps were not going anywhere to reallocate that to areas that might be a little bit more pertinent in today's day and age. The policy was written four or five years ago. The world has changed considerably in, the, in that time. And so I hope to see that to happen very quickly and for them to be able to deploy that money um, just as quickly. All right, sir, just about a minute left here, but NDP spending pledges, uh, how did the budget address those in particular? Again, the liberal NDP supply and confidence agreement that was struck a couple of weeks ago that would see the NDP support the government, you know, part of that, uh, there are some things in there like dental care. Dental care, I think, was near the top of the list. Today, the, gov the government made a big time uh, down payment on that, um, you know, 5.2 billion over five years and then close to $2 billion ongoing. It's going to be very hard, I think, for the for the NDP to criticize the government uh, on this budget. They're going to get a lot of what they want in dental care. And then there's some other pieces around housing uh, that, the, that the government is doing, as well as raising taxes in some areas and addressing some tax loopholes. So 
overall, I think the NDP is going to be quite pleased. Um, I think they're going to have to white, walk that tightrope so that those hardcore NDP voters don't get um, you know, too comfortable with the idea that the NDP are supporting the government too much. Up next, we have retired Major General Dennis Thompson discussing the atrocities in Ukraine and how Russia is using misinformation in the conflict. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. As gruesome videos and photos of bodies emerge from the Kyiv suburb of Bucha, Kremlin-backed media outlets are denouncing them as a hoax. In detailed broadcasts to millions of viewers, correspondents and hosts of Russian state TV channels are reporting on this, saying that some photo and video evidence of the killings were fake. This while others showed that Ukrainians were responsible for the bloodshed. But satellite images from early March show the dead were left out on the streets of Bucha for weeks. The photos and videos have set off a new wave of global condemnation and revulsion. Well, joining us now to get a better idea of what is happening on the ground in Ukraine is Dennis Thompson, retired Major General and Fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. General Thompson, welcome to Forum Daily, sir. Good to be here. Thank you. So we mentioned that Russian state TV are basically calling all of these civilian killings in Bucha a hoax. Uh, what evidence do we have of these atrocities, not only in Bucha, but we're hearing about civilian killings in Mariupol as well? Well, as you mentioned, uh, Nima, it's, the satellite imagery itself is proof positive that this was done by the Russians because the satellite imagery is dated from the period of the Russian occupation. Uh, in addition, you've got reputable reporters on the scene within hours of the Russian withdrawal, and they are soliciting eyewitness reports. And these are reporters that have been in several war zones. And, 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 and then plus on top of that is all the smartphone cameras, which didn't exist in previous wars that have recorded a number of uh, atrocities in a lifetime. So uh, the bottom line is the Russian fakes have been, the Russians have claimed these are fakes. They have been run through a bunch of media experts who have pointed out where the Russian errors are and have essentially debunked it. It's, this is, without question, Russian atrocities. And I want to take a deeper look at this misinformation used by Russia. So how is fake news being used within Russia to justify its invasion of Ukraine, sir? Well, Russian TV, as you probably know, is closely controlled. And it's uh, unlike the West, it's filtered through the government. And it's something that, uh, frankly, the older generation of Russia depends on. Uh, you'll also be aware that, of course, a number of independent media sites were essentially shut down by the Russian government as this conflict uh, kicked off. In the past, they just shouted over top of them. But this time they see they, they believe it's necessary to actually shut them down. So the only access you have to accurate information in Russia is to go through the Internet. And for that, you basically need a VPN. Uh, and unless you're able to dig that deep, you're not going to get the truth as it were. So uh, essentially, the Russian population lives in an echo chamber, an echo chamber that is controlled by the Russian government. That's how they are uh, portraying this conflict as war and getting the news out to their population, at least their side of it. And meanwhile, NATO Secretary General is saying that Russian forces are repositioning for a critical phase of the war. So what exactly is this critical phase and what do you expect this to look like? Well, I think it's no secret that the Russians, as we've already talked about, have pulled back from Kiev and the area around Kiev and back into uh, back into Russia and have repositioned to take parts of the east and the southern uh, parts of, of Ukraine. Uh, they're aimed clearly at the Donbass. And of course, they want to take out Maripol. The whole military idea is to create a land bridge between the Donbass region and Russia and the, the bit that they've already annexed in 2014, which is the Crimea. Uh, I think we can expect to see a lot of combat in that area. I'm not convinced that the Russians have the stomach for it anymore. There are lots of reports of continued low Russian morale and, in fact, combat refusals on, on the part of some combat forces that have been committed to this fight. So what that means is that Russia will continue to pound civilian areas, areas in an effort to get them to... Uh, uh, to, to get them to surrender. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. The initiative has clearly shifted from Russia to Ukraine, and that mm -hmm. is good news. 
All right, sir, just a quick 45 seconds left here, but advocates are calling for more action by Canada in this war. So what else can we do as a country? Well, I think we need to say really quickly that Canada has done an awful lot. Under this Operation Unifier that you may have heard of, Canada has trained over 30,000 junior leaders in Ukraine since 2015. And it's that change in command culture inside the Ukrainian military that has done a lot. So that, that's a plus. We need to reinforce the enhanced forward presence battle group that we have in Latvia under Operation Reassurance. And NATO has committed to more forces to that area to make sure that Russia doesn't try to nibble that off. And finally, we have to take this 2% of GDP target seriously. And I hope to see some big movement on behalf of this government during the budget, which is about to be announced on Thursday. All right, General Thompson, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. My pleasure. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a short break. A recent Canada-wide survey by the University of Saskatchewan suggests people are becoming more divided on issues like COVID-19 and politics. The National Phone Survey by the Canadian Hub for Applied and Social Research suggests some Canadians are even reducing contact with friends or family. Jason DeSano, research director of the survey, says people's answers were largely influenced by their political leaning. He says identity politics taking hold in the U.S. are now carrying over into Canada. Mr. DeSano joins us now. Sir, welcome back or welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you. My pleasure. So let's start with unpacking the survey's main findings for our viewers. Yeah, so um, for this particular survey, we asked a number of questions around the extent to which Canadians are becoming uh, more divided around a number of different issues. And we got some pretty interesting findings, um, findings that in, in some respects are actually a bit um, surprising and, and perhaps um, equally uh, disturbing. So three quarters of those who were surveyed, and this was a survey that we conducted in early March of 1,000 Canadians coast to coast, um, three quarters of those surveyed, so three out of four Canadians uh, indicate that we have become more polarized as a society over the last year. Um, that's a pretty significant majority of Canadians who feel as much. Um, we also asked questions around the extent to which uh, Canadians feel they're being sort of, we've been united or divided amongst a number of different issues. Um, COVID, the COVID pandemic and the recent fall federal election um, were most likely to be cited as Canadians in this particular survey as issues that have served to divide Canadians coast to coast. So 73% of those who were surveyed cited the federal election as uh, uh, something that's divided Canadians. And 72% of those who were surveyed cited the COVID-19 pandemic as something that has served to uh, divide Canadians. Um, another finding that was perhaps surprising and again, a bit disappointing uh, was 40% of those surveyed. So two out of five Canadians indicated that they have um, reduced contact with a friend or family member over the last year. Um, and most commonly that was due to either differing views or opinions related to the pandemic or politics. Some very interesting findings there. So uh, what led to conducting a survey on Canadian unity in the first place, sir? Yeah, so we actually conducted a very similar survey for uh, for CPC News and here in Saskatchewan uh, back in December, and that survey garnered some pretty interesting results. And we thought uh, it would be really interesting to roll out similar questions on a national scale to see what sort of uh, results we're able to generate. And the time when we were sort of considering sort of the questions we were going to ask for this this next quarterly iteration of the national survey, so the whole trucker convoy thing was going on in Ottawa, and it seemed seemed a really appropriate time to go ahead and ask questions like these around sort of the extent to which we're becoming more polarized or, or divided as Canadians. And did the answers uh, maybe differ depending on the region or province these questions were asked? Yeah, we did see um, a number of significant differences by region of the country. So, for example, um, those of us in, in the Prairie Provinces, so that being Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, were more likely, for example, to identify that um, issues around fighting climate change were more likely to divide us as Canadians. Um, things like the assault uh, weapons ban was more likely to divide Canadians. Um, those in Quebec were less likely than other regions of the country to um, have reduced contact with a friend or family member uh, because of a, a differing view or opinion. So there were certainly a number of regional differences that we saw across the country. 
And it seems that politics and COVID-19 were the top of the list uh, nationally. So uh, what does this say of the influence of politics and the pandemic in recent years? I would suggest the results that we see um, coming out of a survey like this definitely tend to go in lockstep with sort of the population in the various regions of the province. So, you know, some of the examples that I was citing a, a few moments ago or a few minutes ago around sort of the, you know, views and opinions on the prairie provinces around sort of unites us versus divides us. We tend to see sort of um, sort of a, a general alignment of people's views and opinions on some of these issues um, in relation to sort of the political leanings of the various regions of the country. So for for example, you know, the prairie regions tending to be a bit more sort of uh, conservative leaning, central Canada, Ontario, Quebec tending to be a bit sort of moderate in its views. So the results that we see this particular survey do tend to align with sort of views and opinions of folks living in the various regions. All right, sir, a quick 30 seconds left here. But since you mentioned this is a similar situation in the U.S., uh, can policymakers maybe learn from patterns in the U.S.? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think the extent to which we're seeing sort of increases in divisions. And, and we've always been divided as Canadians. I mean, you know, we've been divided going back many, many years. Um, but I think those divisions have been amplified by the pandemic. And I think the extent to which those divisions have also become sort of more obvious and apparent have been amplified in the last two years through things like social media and the like. The UN Health Agency warns that because many countries have stopped widespread testing, many cases are likely going undetected. It is urging countries not to drop their COVID-19 protocols too quickly. And it says it's tracking an Omicron variant that is a recombination of two earlier versions. Meanwhile, Ontario residents aged 60 and older who had their first booster dose of a vaccine at least five months ago will be eligible for a second booster dose starting Thursday. Wastewater data suggests infections are almost as high as in early January when Omicron was at its peak. BC plans to offer people 70 and up a fourth dose this spring, while Nova Scotia is preparing for its second round of booster shots. Well, joining us now to give us the latest updates on COVID variants and vaccines is Dr. Abhishek Rout, Medical Director at Apple Tree Medical Group. Doctor, welcome back to Forum Daily. Pleasure to be here. So some concerning news here in terms of rising case counts across the country. Uh, what do we know so far about this, Dr. Rout? Right. So the virus level has really been rising rapidly since mid-March. Uh, in the past week, it's really, really going up. And every day we are seeing it higher. Uh, of course, we're looking at wastewater numbers. When we look at the case numbers, what we're seeing is we're currently at about 9,000 new cases and about 4,000 hospitalizations in Canada. In the beginning of January, we were seeing about 40,000 cases and about 4,000 hospitalizations. So still a little bit of a difference. And we've got to watch those hospitalizations hospitalization numbers more carefully. Another thing to watch out for is this new Omicron variant, according to the UN Health Agency. Uh, they're saying it's a recombination of two earlier versions of the o Omicron variant. It's being called the XE variant. Uh, so what information do we have on this? We, uh, we have very little at this time. What we do know is that the data from the UK suggests that XE is likely slightly more transmissible than even BA2, uh, which was more transmissible than BA1. Uh, but the WHO has re uh, looked at it and it does need more research there. XE currently makes up only 1% of the total COVID-19 cases in the UK. Uh, and there's no evidence so far to suggest that it is somehow immune to our vaccines or immune to uh, natural immunity as well. So some good news in particular. Um, overall, I think it's a matter of seeing how quickly this can grow. So should we be at all worried by these rising cases and this new XC variant, Dr. Rout? Yeah, so I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions around XE, uh, but we're, what we're seeing so far is there's a high level of protection from vaccines and from natural immunity. Uh, so it's possible it may be more transmissible, but it doesn't mean that it's more severe. Uh, given the sheer number of infections we've already seen with Omicron, I think we're going to see a fair number of natural immunity there. Uh, keep in mind, recombinant uh, variants are actually very common and they crop up all the time. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic 
optimistic that there's no significant threat with this one. Uh, looking at the fact that it's called the XE variant, uh, we've had recombinant variants X, A, B, C, D already, and none have been a major threat or concern. So, so far, ca uh, cautiously optimistic there. All right, Dr. Rao. Well, we mentioned Ontario is rolling out fourth doses of vaccines tomorrow. Uh, just how necessary are these fourth doses? Uh, so what we know now is that this fourth dose could really help people who are frail, people who are at the older uh, end of the spectrum, uh, and people who are at the greatest risk of a severe outcome of COVID. Uh, do we know if it's going to really alter the trajectory of this wave? Unsure at this time, uh, but we do know that it'll help individuals who are most at risk for severe outcomes. And what about those uh, who are of a younger demographic, Dr. Rout, especially those who may have already had two vaccine doses already? Uh, should they consider a third and fourth booster dose? That's right. For that, we really look at NACI, which is the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Uh, so far, NACI is really recommending uh, provinces prioritize people aged 80 and older, long-term care residents, uh, and certainly the next uh, step is 70 to 79 and moving down. It's still unclear on whether uh, the younger adults and adolescents will necessarily benefit from a second booster shot. All right, Dr. Rout, a minute left here, but how do booster doses compare to the full vaccine doses and how could they help in protecting you and others during the pandemic? It's a good question. So a COVID booster shot is basically an additional dose of the vaccine, uh, which helps maintain strong protection uh, from coronavirus disease, especially severe disease. Uh, protection that you get from a normal dose starts to weaken uh, faster than we thought. Uh, even with Pfizer, even after five months, we were starting to see a fade of that immunity. Uh, so getting a booster dose helps really extend that protection even against Delta and Omicron variants. So far, we've got multiple studies by the CDC as well as the Journal of American Medical Association, which really shows that this booster uh, provides a lot more protection against Delta and Omicron variants than being fully vaccinated or even not vaccinated at all. All right, Dr. Rao, thank you again for joining us for our health segment.